Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com as ever. I am your host, Harry Simu. And uh, seen as the, there's stormy weather outside and there's not much going on today and we've had Premier League games cancelled. We've had, of course, the North London derby between the Arsenal ladies and the Spurs ladies um, game postponed as well. Uh, we thought that it was the perfect opportunity to bring you another edition of the podcast. And I apologise that there hasn't been as many in the last couple of weeks. That's been largely down to the fact that work has been crazy, but that's always a good thing, isn't it? So I'm not complaining, uh, so please don't take it that way. Um, But on this edition of the Chronicles of Aguna, we're going to tackle one of the most divisive debates amongst the Arsenal fan base. And the question today is, is Mesut Ozil holding Arsenal back? Does he still have something to offer or should the club be looking to move the former Germany international on? I'm going to take you through some of the facts, some stats um, before sharing my personal thoughts on the matter. And then I want to hear from you guys in the comments section below. Now, Mesut Ozil was signed in 2013 from Real Madrid. Mesut Ozil cost Arsenal a whopping £42.3 million, according to TransferMarket.com at the time. Um, And his signing was a huge coup. Now, there was a real buzz uh, and there was lots of excitement, uh, you know, around the place when he arrived and the general consensus was that Arsenal had finally turned the corner in in the sense that they were now able to attract the best players again they were able to go out and and financially compete with the rest and people started to feel good about the club again at that point after a few you know bad years uh, particularly when we first moved to the Emirates Stadium we had to lose uh, quite a few important players because of Uh, you know, maybe not necessarily just money, but because the ambition of the club um, didn't really match that of those players. And I know we were upset at the time and we were furious with some of those players. But what we've learned since then is that they actually had a point in most cases. Um, Arsene Wenger's influence on bringing Mesut Ozil to the club was, of course, huge. He reportedly picked up the phone and, you know, spoke to him in German and, and really impressed the player and persuaded him to trade Madrid for North London. Now, yeah, Real Madrid were looking to offload Mesut Ozil, but you still have to convince the player because there would have, at that point, uh, you know, for sure, been a number of clubs interested in taking on Mesut Ozil in acquiring his services and having him at their club. And so Arsene Wenger's influence there should not be understated. And Arsene Wenger's taken criticism, you know, in recent years in particular for not getting certain deals over the line, um, for being a little bit stubborn, maybe for missing some really good opportunities. But in this instance, uh, you know, his influence helped and and was a massive uh, push for Mesut Ozil to come to the club to make him feel like the Emirates was the right place for him. So for that, Arsene Wenger deserves credit. Now, regardless of what many people think of Ozil now, there's no denying, though, is there at the time that it was a huge, huge deal. And I think, you know, you'd be lying if you were to sit there now and say, actually, when we signed Ozil, I was a bit like, meh this isn't the right deal or, you know, I I wasn't excited by it. I think you're lying if you're saying that because we were all excited. Maybe it hasn't worked out as we'd have wanted. Maybe he's not performing at the level, uh, you know, that we all expect from him currently, but we all accept that at the time, surely, this was a massive transfer for the Arsenal. So at the start of 2018, Mesa Ozil signed a contract extension that would see him become the Premier League's highest paid player at the time, a deal worth a jaw-dropping £350,000 per week. That's before tax, of course. But again, the fan base rejoiced at the news. And do you remember why? Because just a few days prior, Alexis Sanchez, our main man, whose contract was also due to expire in the near future, had jumped ship and joined Manchester United, one of our fiercest rivals. And it was a kind of, you know, not that it was a coup again, because, you know, you can't repeat that sort of buzz and excitement of bringing in a world class player to your club anywhere further down the line. But the fact that he'd signed another deal and we'd managed to keep him came as a huge boost to many who were worried that we may end up losing Ozil as well as Sanchez. And let's put it right, when those two arrived, you know, Arsenal improved and Arsenal went on to to break the trophy drought, etc., etc. Um, so there was lots of positives around the place. And those two were without doubt our standout players. So when Messer Ozil signed, again, People were happy. People were pleased. I know I was, and I'm sure most of you were um, as well. 
and particularly with what had gone on with Sanchez uh, just a few days prior, the news that Mesa Erzo had committed his future to the club came as a huge boost. Now, there's probably an argument that says we kept the wrong one. Um, but if we did let them both go at the time, can you imagine the uproar? Can you imagine people having a go at Arsene Wenger, having a go at the board, having a go at the ownership? If they had allowed both Alexis Sanchez and Mesa Ozil to leave the club in the same transfer window or to or to have allowed Ozil to leave on a free transfer at the end of the next season or whatever it was going to be. It, the point here is that hindsight is a wonderful thing. But at the time, we were all pleased with the moves that Arsenal were making. Were there raised eyebrows about the amount that Mesa Ozil would be receiving? I'm sure there were and rightly so. But we're going to come on to, to talk about it a little bit later on in the program. But Mesut Ozil's commercial influence, particularly in the Middle East, particularly in the, the Muslim world, is huge. It is huge. And it's such an, uh, a big deal. And it comes, you know, as such a huge boost to Arsenal. You know, Adidas uh, done the kit deal with Arsenal this season. And, and I'm not saying that it was solely down to Mesut Ozil. But having such a high profile athlete at that club would have no doubt helped um, in getting Adidas uh, to, to sponsor us in in the amount that they were going to put on the table, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So whether you rate him as a player or not, his influence globally cannot be denied. The guy's got more social media followers than the club. Is that the way we're measuring things these days? It's not the ideal way of measuring things, but in 2020, it's a pretty good indicator of how big and how popular somebody is. And so, you know, we have to take that into consideration. Now, looking at some of the facts, Mesut Ozil played 200, well, to date, has played 250 times for the Gunners, scoring 43 goals and providing 76 assists. That is a direct goal contribution on average every 2.1 games. That is very reasonable. He's won a World Cup with Germany, three FA Cups with the Arsenal and a La Liga title with Los Galacticos, amongst other things. So why is the 31-year-old so divisive? And why are so many Arsenal fans so desperate to see the back of him? Here's my view. I'd say it stems from frustration. Frustration at the fact that we don't see the best of Ozil anywhere near often enough these days. But where I disagree with the masses is that it's not solely down to him. The team's steady decline has made it difficult for anybody to flourish. And Ozil is no exception to that rule. The best we saw of Ozil was when he had Alexis Sanchez to link up with. The pair were heads and shoulders above anything else we had in terms of quality. However, due to our inability to be competitive in other areas of the field, it became impossible to keep the pair. In particular, Alexis Sanchez, who at the time seemed a little bit more ambitious, a little bit more ruthless, a little bit more willing to kick up a fuss and upset the status quo, because he wasn't willing to just sit in his comfort zone at the Emirates Stadium. And that's something that you can perhaps accused Mesut Ozil of, but Alexis Sanchez wasn't going to have it. Now, there are three things that everybody loves to complain about when talking about Mesut Ozil. So I'm going to touch on those things. His salary. It's the first thing that everybody talks about. Why is Mesut Ozil on 350 grand a week, blah, 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 blah. It is excessive. There's no doubt in that. And considering the output that we're currently getting from the German, you know, you, you could you could make that argument and you'd have a valid point. But that's not what's holding Arsenal back in the transfer market at the moment. Mesut Ozil alone is not the problem. Arsenal's wage bill overall is way too big. And that comes as much as it does from Mesut Ozil as the other players who are not performing, very average in what they bring to the table, but they're also clogging up the wage bill. There's some, we, you know, we had Henrik Mkhitaryan at the club you know, obviously he's on loan at Roma at the moment, but he was earning near enough 200 grand a week. You know, uh, th 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 there's just far too many players on big wages for people to sit and point at one individual and say he's the reason that we can't do this and we can't do that uh, in the transfer market. It's far more complex than that. And the issue is far wider than that. So just open your eyes and, and look into things a little bit more and understand the way the club works and the finances and, and this and that. And Mesut Ozil sh sells more shirts than anybody. Mesut Ozil, you know, could have played a part in, in Arsenal getting the Adidas deal. So you've got to take those things into consideration as well. I'm not saying that it's because of Mesut Ozil that Adidas came along or 
that the club survives because of Mr. Ozil's commercial revenue. But that all plays a part. And Arsenal would have believed that he is worth that, given what they knew about his commerciability, uh, commerciality, I should say. Is that the right word? Correct me if I'm wrong. Arsenal would have known exactly what they were doing when they offered him that deal. And whatever you want to say about Arsenal, they don't spend money that they don't need to. And they don't spend money that they don't feel is worth it um, at the time. And, and, and so it's very difficult to sit here and say that giving him that contract was a mistake. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. When you look back on it, you could probably say that maybe 350 is a little bit excessive. Maybe we overstepped the mark. But you've got to remember, again, as I already touched on, Arsenal were desperate to keep hold of Mesut Ozil at the time. They just watched Alexis Sanchez kick up a fuss, leave his contract to the last year and move on to Manchester United in what turned out to be a completely shit deal uh, between the two clubs where we ended up with Henrik Mkhitaryan. So the, there was desperation there. There was an eagerness to protect an asset. And if it meant throwing 350 on the table on a weekly basis, Arsenal were obviously at the time were happy to do that. Now, the second thing people always moan about is his attitude. And it's one of those old footballing cliches, isn't it? But he's just not that type of player. He's not going to steamroller into challenges. He's not going to make slide tackles. He's not going to beat his chest uh, in order to get the crowd going. It just isn't Mesut Ozil. He appears casual at times. But I don't buy that a sports person at the highest level can get there without having A, the desire to succeed, and B, a real passion for what they do. So to question Mesut Ozil's desire to play football, I think is silly. I think it's naive. Um, Does he always, you know, give the right vibes in terms of his body language? No, he doesn't. But is that solely what we're measuring players' performances on? Because you'd think it was the way some people talk about it. Um, You know, for me, the, the attitude and the lazy argument is lazy. You know, it, it is a lazy argument because the statistics prove that Mesut Ozil covers as much ground as anybody else. The statistics prove that particularly in the last few weeks under Mikel Arteta, Mesut Ozil has been winning the ball back. Mesut Ozil is completing the most passes in the final third, etc., etc., etc. There are lots and lots of things that Mesut Ozil does do uh, and does bring to the table that we should all be pleased about as well. I guess the reason I think that argument is so prominent, particularly here in the UK, and I don't want to sound like I'm having a go at everybody here, is because I think the attitude towards football here is very different to that of the rest of the continent, to that of those, um, you know, in Spain, in Italy, in Germany even, where hard work seems to be appreciated as much as, you know, flair and skill and the the issue I take with that is that hard work should be a given I shouldn't be in football stadiums and hear louder cheers for slide tackles than I do for wonderful pieces of skill but it's that attitude it's that mentality that so many English football fans have that's not saying all of you um you know but there seems to be that sort of what's the word that caveman attitude towards football and people maybe miss positives and bits of skill and, you know, clever pieces of movement that open space for other people, etc., etc., because they always seem to be looking at the, the simplistic stuff, which is, has he has he got his uh, his knees muddy? Has he made a slide tackle? Has he bust a lung to get back? And those things are important. They're equally as important, but they're not more important. And that's kind of my point here. Um, his assist record is something that people have always talked about. And this is number three. Um, you know, his assist record when he first joined the club and for the first few years was highly impressive. It was incredible, in fact. And people were, you know, pleased by it, um, always went on and on about it, and rightly so. And it was often the argument used by those who want to defend Mesut Ozil. Um, you know, and I'm trying to stay as neutral as I can during this discussion before I give you my take. Um, so, you know, for me, I don't like the fact that people hide behind the assist statistic. I think it's a very easy statistic to hide behind. Um, I think it doesn't tell as much of a story as people would like you to think. Um, Because, you know, I could put an alternative spin on it and say, imagine Olivier Giroud was a a more lethal striker than he was. How many assists more would Mesut Ozil have to his name? You know, an assist is down to the, the striker putting the ball in the back of the net for you to be awarded that assist. You don't get assists when people miss chances. So 
is it a way of measuring a player's performance? It's one way. It's a way of getting an idea, but it shouldn't be the sole way. And I think that those who have defended Mesut Ozil have been very guilty of using that as their sole argument. And for me, it's not, you know, it's not on. Football is far more complex, as I've already said. You know, it could be the pass before the assist that is just as crucial. It could be a piece of movement that drags a defender out of position that therefore creates space for somebody else to exploit. It could be occupying opponents. You know, Frank Lampard spoke in the aftermath of the Chelsea game about how Mesa Ozil's movement of popping up on the right, popping up on the left caused them problems and they didn't know how to pick him up. They didn't know how to deal with him. So there's those aspects to the game as well. And I just wish that people would would not dismiss those. That's kind of uh, my only point here. Watch the game with your eyes open. Sometimes watch the game back without the emotion, w- without the adrenaline of a live game where you're worried about what the outcome's going to be, etc., etc. Those things are important too. And and I just think that when we have a go at Mesut Ozil, sometimes the arguments are, are a little bit simplistic in my opinion. Um, is he the long-term future of Arsenal? Based on his age alone, you have to say no, he's not. Are there better number 10s in the world? abso fucking lootly there are. Are there better midfielders in the world? Of course there are. Are there better passers of the ball? Of course there are. Are there players with better vision? Of course they are. But are there players with all of those attributes who are better than Mesut Ozil at Arsenal today? And the answer is no. And that is the key point. The answer is no. The alternatives are Joe Willock who may go on to become a good player one day. But is he ready yet? No, I don't think he is. I don't think you can rely on those players. The flip side of that is, if he is the future of Arsenal, shouldn't he be getting more game time? Shouldn't he be getting... Um, you know, more chances and and more minutes so that he can develop to be ready or more ready for next season. Yeah, there is an argument for that as well, and I totally accept that. But Unai Emery came into Arsenal and Unai Emery upset the status quo. Unai Emery ruffled feathers. Unai Emery fell out with people. Unai Emery uh, tried to change the dynamic in the dressing room and he failed. He failed miserably, so miserably that he had to turn to Mesut Ozil at the end of his tenure to try and dig him out of a hole. What that says to me is that it's very important to keep that harmony within the dressing room. And you know that Mesut Ozil was a very popular figure. Am I saying that Mikel Arteta is going to stick with him forever? No, I'm not saying that. But Mikel Arteta has probably been wary of the disharmony that Unai Emery's approach caused. And he doesn't want that this early on in his tenure. He doesn't need that. He hasn't got the alternative options at his disposal at this moment in time to be able to go and piss off the likes of Aubameyang, the likes of Ozil. Because like it or not, right now, they are very, very important players to this football club. So, uh, you know, I back Mikel Arteta's approach uh, approach, Sorry, when it comes to Mesut Ozil. I've got no issue with it. Let's... um, Let's uh, have a look at the results of the poll that I put on Twitter earlier on where I asked the question, is it time for for Mesut Ozil to move on? Is Mesut Ozil holding Arsenal back? Then I'll read through some of your comments and then we will uh, wrap it up there. Uh, Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. You know the draw by now. Uh, Let's uh, jump over to uh, social media and have a look at the results of this poll. So as it stands, and there is still uh, more hours remaining on this poll, so if you want to uh, vote on it, it's at Harry Simu on my Twitter account. You can head over there um, and, and give it a vote. As it currently stands, 75% of you believe that Mesut Ozil is holding Arsenal back and 25% say he's not. 75%, that is huge. That is huge. It almost makes this a non-debate, but that's my point. It is such a good debate. There is so many points and arguments that we made on both sides that it cannot be this one-sided. Surely, if you believe it is, um, and whatever your opinion is, whatever side you're on, if you believe there is no debate and there is no argument about this, let me know why in the comments. I want to hear from you guys. Um, This is a very different format to the usual shows we do, but I want to hear from you guys. It's a bit of a debate. We've got time to do these sort of things now that Arsenal are playing. Um, so, yeah, head over. Check it out. Let's uh, let's go on to some of your comments. Um, Alexis says, his productiveness has gone on strike. Um, Callum Ferguson says, he contributes to keeping the ball moving, but little else. Waste of money in our current situation. We have to cut ties. Uh, Hasib says, 
Unpopular opinion, Ozil was a panic buy. Wenger never planned to build a team around him. Think Ozil performed the best he could in a team that was never structured for him. However, given his age, I can't see him getting any better and therefore don't see the point in keeping him. Um, A1 Gunner says, I think he's holding Arsenal back. He's far too easy to mark out of games. And when that happens, I've noticed he drifts really far wide, leaving a big gap in front of our base of players. It means unless we're truly dominant, there isn't a strong link between the defence and attack. Uh, Gaffar says, I'm a strong supporter of Ozil, but it's fair to say his performances has not been up to the standard. There are so many weaknesses to his game. If I'm being honest, first, he can easily be marked out as noticed in Chelsea uh, and Burnley games more recently. Um, Darren Dupree says, definitely, Mesa Ozil's holding Arsenal back 100%. Theo Samuel says, I think it's time. I don't hate him, but he has been ineffective in a lot of games. Uh, it's time for him to look for a new challenge because he's coming to the end of his career. So pretty much everybody um, wants to see the back of Mesut Ozil. And I'm shocked by that. I'm shocked that the argument is so one-sided. Um, because as I said, I think there are good points to be made on both sides of the debate. But I want to hear from you guys. Let me know what you think. Uh, thank you for tuning in to this bonus edition of the podcast. We'll be back uh, on Monday with some more uh, Arsenal-related content and a bit of Premier League-based content as well as we look to broaden our horizons slightly. Uh, but thank you once again for tuning in. If you can hear the rain in the background, this storm is killing us here. Until next time, take care. Ciao.